so my grand rounds topic is DVT and PE in pregnancy. Um, the little munchkin in the corner down there is uh, was my supervisor um, at home, and uh, Dr. Park was my grand round supervisor via Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to start my rounds with uh, two cases. So the first case is a 25-year-old female who presents with left leg swelling and pain for two days. Her vitals are normal. She is a healthy 32-week pregnant lady, G3P1. She has no uh, major past medical history. She's just on the prenatal vitamin. And clinically, you're suspicious of a DVT and are very happy she had no signs or symptoms of a PE. Uh, the second case uh, is another 25-year-old female, uh, but this time presenting with shortness of breath for two days. She's tachycardic with an SpO2 of 91. Uh, she's healthy, 32 weeks pregnant, G3P1. And again, uh, otherwise healthy, just on a prenatal vitamin and clinically uh, quite suspicious for APE. Uh, so just talking about some epidemiology of VTE cases in pregnancy, there's about one to two cases per every thousand deliveries. Uh, PEs, despite CTs and everything else, still make up 9% of maternal deaths in the USA. And in pregnancy, uh, the risk of VTE is about 5 to 10 times that of the uh, average healthy population, and about 15 to 25, uh, sorry, 15 to 35 times uh, the risk of a healthy population in the immediate postpartum period, which is usually defined as those first six weeks. Um, a DVTs in general, about 80% of them occur in the left leg in pregnancy, 64% are iliofemoral, and 17% uh, are isolated to the iliac vein. Um, Uh, sorry, greater than 90% uh, of those worked up will be actually negative for D VTE despite symptoms because the symptoms of DVT and PE are actually common pregnancy symptoms as well. Um, so for talking about uh, PE and pregnancy, we can't do that without talking a bit of radiation and risk. Um, so in terms of radiation, uh, some background things that I think are important to know when discussing amount of radiation uh, that people are exposed to in pregnancy as well as uh, what the fetus is exposed to is knowing the difference between the absorbed radiation, which is the actual amount of radiation delivered to that uh, tissue um, and is expressed in the units of milligrays. So when you actually look at a CT scan, often it will tell you the amount of milligrays delivered in that scan. Um, and that's typically the actual absorbed dose. Uh, the equivalent dose uh, is expressed in millisieverts and is the absorbed dose multiplied by a weighting factor that adjusts for the type of radiation as well as the type of tissue being exposed. In medical radiation for CTs, x-rays of people, that weighting factor is generally one. Uh, so essentially one milligray would equal one millisievert. Uh, and then to make things a little more confusing, there's also the effective dose of radiation, uh, which is the equivalent dose now adjusted for the actual uh, risk that that tissue uh, gets based on its radiosensitivity when exposed to radiation. And this is also expressed in millisieverts. Uh, so when looking at studies that talk about the amount of radiation, knowing whether or not they're talking about an absorbed equivalent or effective dose is an important difference. So uh, this is just some examples of uh, background radiations, and this would be of uh, actual effective radiation, uh, so expressed in millisieverts. And these are the numbers that most people, uh, when they think of, if they can name any sort of radiation numbers, um, it's typically effective doses they can name. Uh, so a transatlantic flight will be about 0 0.02 millisieverts. Uh, you know, a dental x-ray is very, very minimal at 0 0.005 millisieverts. Um, and uh, whereas CT scans are much higher. Uh, background dose radiation uh, is often around one millisievert, though depends on where you're living. Um, and in general, um, most background places would be sort of under two millisieverts um, from all the uh, studies I'd seen. Um, so why do we care about radiation and uh, pregnancy? Well, it's always, everyone's worried about radiation and a fetus. So there's an x-ray that you never want to get by surprise. You can see there's a fetal spine and head in the pelvis. Um, and it's 
directly in the field of view on an abdominal x-ray. So that's not the surprise x-ray you ever want to see. Um, so when talking about radiation risk to a fetus, uh, background radiation for a fetus over nine months is about 0.5 to 1 milligrays. Um, for this, I'm going to talk in milligrays because it's very difficult to assess what the actual effective dose would be to a fetus uh, because you would have to know the sensitivity of that tissue, which as you can imagine changes throughout pregnancy um, and isn't really something that can be studied. So typically when we talk about radiation doses to um, any sort of pregnancy, it's talked about in actual amount of dose, so in milligrays. Um, we know that ultrasound is the safest imaging and there's no known fetal risks. Uh, plain films are uh, considered quite safe. There's essentially neg negligible dose to the fetus as long as it's not in view. Um, and we do still recommend shielding. Uh, for example, for a chest x-ray, you can shield outside the field of view for uh, the fetus. And uh, an abdominal and lumbar spine are going to be your highest amount of radiation because it's essentially shooting x-rays directly through um, a gravid uterus and uh, typically would expose um, them to about one to three and a half milligrays. Uh, a CTPA, uh, which uses the iodinated um, contrast, uh, which is considered safe in pregnancy. It doesn't cross the placenta, and it's actually considered a class B drug by the FDA, which is the same as Tylenol. Uh, so in terms of contrast, that's not uh, a known risk. Um, they, we often still shield. However, shielding in a CT scan because of how directed the radiation um, really does nothing to dose reduce, but um, is often done to sort of make everyone feel better. Um, and the actual dose administered to the fetus is only 0.2 milligrays. So uh, an abdominal x-ray or a lumbar spine, you know, if you're thinking that you would consider doing that, a CTPE is not, uh, is not higher risk to the pregnancy. Uh, these are just some examples of other amounts of radiation uh, that occur while um, imaging a pregnant person. So you can see a C-spine, chest x-ray, thoracic spine, essentially anything where the fetus is at a view is uh, basically negligible. And then anything where uh, you are, have a uterus in the uh, field of view is where you start to see quite high doses with the CT abdomen pelvis being the most. Um, so in terms of effects on the fetus, the major organogenesis is in that first eight weeks, um, and about 100 milligrays is where they start to consider that uh, a likely sort of fatal dose for pregnancy. Um, and uh, anything sort of around that would be also very high risk for teratogenicity. Um, the rapid neurodevelopment is uh, eight to 15 weeks, and anything between 10 to 100 milligrays, again, hard to study. Um, it's all just sort of based on case exposures, um, but anything in that 10 to 100 range may cause some sort of neural effects uh, after birth. Um, and any exposure in utero of about 10 milligrays will increase uh, childhood risk of cancer by 0.4% uh, um, is uh, sort of what the case studies have looked at. Uh, once they're past 15 weeks, the risk of teratogenicity is essentially gone because of organogenesis um, already being completed. So it's more that increased risk of childhood cancer um, is the higher risk once you're past 15 weeks. Um, so with that being said, the largest risk in, a, in CT in a pregnant person is actually to the mom, not the baby. Um, gravid breasts and uh, lungs are uh, extremely radiosensitive. Um, in general, they're radiosensitive organs, but in pregnancy, much more so. Uh, so a CTPA in London um, averages about 30 to 60 milligrays, uh, which translate to again, depending on the amount of milligrays, 20 millisieverts of effective dose or less, depending on the radiation. Um, CTPAs, depending on the scanner, who's doing it, the body habitus are extremely variable in the amount of radiation. Um, and that's one of the struggles with picking what number to quote in terms of actual effective radiation because of there's such huge variability in the doses. Um, a perfusion scan is significantly lower dose um, and much less milligrays uh, exposed to uh, the breast, uh, but is sustained a little bit longer because of the injected uh, tracker. 
Um, a CTPA in your non-pregnant young female is estimated to increase lifetime risk of breast and lung cancer by about 2.2%. Uh, so there's not really a stat in pregnancy. Again, that's not really a study you can do, um, but would be assumed to be much higher because of the radiosensitivity of the tissue. Uh, so here's some charts of actual uh, comparison of a CTPA versus a VQ scan. Uh, so the wide range of a CTPA of 10 to 70 milligrays compared to less than 1.5 milligrays on a VQ um, is quite a substantial difference. Um, and at the bottom, you can see they have a VQ scan at 2.1 millisieverts effective dose uh, to breast and lung tissue versus up to 20 in that CTPA high resolution 64 slices. Um, so when at all possible, the guidelines, and I think most emerge physicians should opt for a VQ scan uh, in, uh, well, most people, in most young people with normal lungs, but especially in pregnancy. And again, that risk is really to limit the risk to mom as opposed to baby. Uh, so uh, some factors that increase your risk of VTE in pregnancy uh, include unilateral leg swelling, previous history of VTE, family history, high BMI, uh, age over 40, bed rest of 70 day, or sorry, of seven days, or any sort of medical illness. So very similar to the same things that would make you higher risk in a average population. Those are the same things that make you higher risk in pregnancy. Um, so for symptoms of PE in pregnancy, because this is always the struggle is that, and why so many people worked up for VTE in pregnancy end up being negative, um, is they can be quite, uh, um, common symptoms of PE can be present in pregnancy in, uh, in a normal pregnancy. Uh, so, you know, some major symptoms of PE can be dyspnea, uh, chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, tachycardia, shock, and syncope. Uh, as well as signs of DVT or leg swelling. So when looking at uh, signs or side effects that people experience in pregnancy, 70% of people experience dyspnea and it can start as early as uh, the first trimester. Uh, so even without the physical obstruction of uh, a gravid uterus, dyspnea is a very common symptom in pregnancy. Uh, the increased heart rate, also very common uh, to account for the uh, 30 to 50% increase in cardiac output. Uh, the resting heart rate of a pregnant woman will go up uh, by even 20 beats per minute. Uh, so depending on the person's fitness level, may make them already right around that 100 uh, beats per minute uh, for a resting heart rate in pregnancy. And then edema, very common, though not typically grossly unilateral, um, especially towards the third trimester, very common symptom in pregnancy. Uh, even with the absence of a DVT. Uh, in terms of a D-dimer, so um, we have high, very high sensitivity, low specificity. Um, there's lots of, uh, the major study was the Adjust PE study um, to talk about age adjusting a, a D-dimer. I'm not gonna talk about that study here. Um, I know we don't do this in London, uh, but it is done in some other eMERGE centers. Uh, it's used um, for people who are low pretest probability to rule out VTE. Anyone who's extremely high risk of VTE or falls into that high risk category, uh, more than a dimer would really be needed to sufficiently rule it out. Um, so in pregnancy, that D-dimer is often falsely elevated uh, and uh, that starts as early as the first trimester. And there's no validated uh, rule out D-dimer um, level in pregnancy. Um, it's uh, been looked at and we'll talk about that, um, but it's never actually been validated. Uh, so going on to uh, sort of the cases, talking specifically about pulmonary embolism in pregnancy um, and how we actually can algorithmically address this and if there's any good ways to rule it out. Um, so why do we care about um, sort of looking at standardized approach to PE in pregnancy? Um, it's something we have in the general population, but not yet in pregnancy, uh, is because having a standardized approach um, will likely keep things from going missed. Uh, so it's just a, it's a, a better standard of care. Uh, more accurate investigation. So uh, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, how sensitive or specific is a CTPE or a VQ in pregnancy? Do we know that they are as accurate in the general population as they are in pregnancy? Um, 
And again, 9% of maternal deaths, despite all the investigations we have, still die of PE. Uh, so it is something that, uh, well, that's not a, uh, a common thing to happen. It, it is still um, a very poor outcome uh, when these things are not uh, caught, whether that's from uh, working up or not presenting. And then the last point is, you know, avoiding radiation. We don't want to be having to CTPE scan every single woman with dyspnea um, when we know that that's a common symptom of pregnancy. So how can we risk stratify uh, people to not be doing unnecessary scans? Uh, so the first study I'm going to talk about is the Pregnancy Adapted Years Algorithm. So this study um, was a prospective uh, trial that uh, uh, looked at applying the years criteria to pregnant patients who presented with symptoms of PE. So the years criteria itself is uh, clinical signs of DVT, hemoptysis, and PE being the most likely diagnosis. And then based on whether or not you... Uh, had any of those criteria, um, a D-dimer cutoff was applied. So if you had no criteria, a D-dimer cutoff of 1,000 was applied. And if you had one to three criteria, a D-dimer cutoff of 500 was applied. Uh, so the study was done at multiple sites. Um, and like I said, they took people who had suspected uh, acute PE as well as were pregnant and risk stratified them based on them falling into uh, zero, one, two, or three years criteria. Uh, so anyone who had no years criteria and a dimer less than 1,000 received no further uh, pulmonary embolism workup. If they were over the cutoff, they received, uh, in this study, it was essentially all CTPAs. And then again, if they met any of the criteria, the cutoff of 500 was used below no investigations and above uh, a CTPA. There was a branch where if there was clinical signs of a DVT or um, they could go on to ultra, uh, compressive ultrasound first, um, in which case if that was positive, they were taken out of the study. However, it was not part of the study to do a compressive ultrasound on all of these women uh, before going on to uh, PE investigations. So in the actual study, um, after uh, they took out the people who had positive uh, compressive ultrasonography, so again, they didn't scan everyone. It was only people who um, they thought had symptoms. Uh, they had 494 patients. Um, of those patients, it was almost half and half for who met years criteria and who didn't. Uh, and then from there, they risk stratified them based on uh, their D-dimer. So uh, of those who met no years criteria, 88 still had a positive D-dimer and went on to be investigated for PE, uh, only one of which actually had a pulmonary embolism. And of those who met at least one criteria, 211 uh, had a dimer above 500, went on to investigation, 15 of which had a pulmonary embolism. Um, the major endpoint, they followed these women up at 90 days, and of all of them, only one person had an unrecognized uh, VTE event, and it was one person who met no years criteria, had a D-timer less than 500, and ended up having a popliteal DVT at the 90-day follow-up. So um, not clear exactly when they developed it in those 90 days, um, and their D-dimer cut off was about 480 uh, at the original presentation. Um, so uh, in terms of the ultrasound, because I thought it was interesting they didn't include that as part of their algorithm, um, they ultrasounded 43 of 47 patients who had symptoms of a DVT, three of which came back positive, and 79 people who um, were uh, had no symptoms of DVT, were still ultrasounded, um, and only one of which came back positives. And no patients had a PE at the 90-day follow-up mark. Um, there were a few, just going back, a few study violations where people underwent scans despite it not being indicated based on the study protocol. None of those who underwent a CTPA based on sort of the clinician judgment, despite them having a below cutoff uh, D-dimer, ended up having a PE. Uh, so the second study, uh, which was covered in um, MRAP at one point, uh, is looking at uh, using the Geneva score and risk stratifying pregnant patients. Um, so again, this was a multi-center prospective study. Um, they had about 395 patients, and they used the Geneva score to risk stratify them into 
uh, low or intermediate risk or high risk. Um, so their algorithm was anyone who was high risk went on to ultrasound and then went on to uh, PE investigation if uh, nothing was found on ultrasound, whereas those who were lower intermediate risk uh, were allowed to have a D-dimer. And if that D-dimer was less than 500, they were considered to have uh, no PE and released. This study also had uh, nobody at the three-month follow-up uh, had a VTE event in those 90 days. Um, they did have uh, the majority of patients were in that sort of low to intermediate risk group. So you can see uh, 46 that were in that group had a negative dimer. 341 who were in the low to intermediate risk group had a positive dimer. Uh, and five of them had no dimer and ended up going on to CTPA anyways. Uh, so of all those people who were low to intermediate risk, 46 of them ended up being ruled out based on the D-dimer, whereas those uh, 341 that even though they were considered low risk still went on to have um, further investigations. Of the 341 uh, patients that had uh, ultrasounds, um, because not everybody, uh, some people missed the ultrasound step, um, only 2% ended up having positive ultrasounds. Uh, in this particular study, 7% uh, of the uh, resulting uh, group had PEs. And again, like I said, no one did at the 90-day follow-up. That wasn't uh, diagnosed originally. Uh, so the Geneva score itself, um, anyone with 0 to 4, uh, 3 points is low risk, 4 to 10 intermediate, and greater than 10 is high risk. And it looks at age, which in a pregnant patient is... Um, not relevant, uh, previous DVT or PE, uh, surgery or limb fracture, inactive uh, malignancy, unilateral lower limb pain, hemoptysis, heart rate, and pain on lower limb palpation or unilateral uh, edema. So those bottom sort of four criteria are obviously much more applicable to the pregnant population or if they've had a history of DVT or PE. Um, so sort of take home uh, points from both these studies for PE. Um, both studies uh, were able to rule out uh, some patients with uh, the D-dimer cutoff uh, and were able to do that without going on to a radiation study. Neither study missed any PEs on 90-day follow-up. Uh, there was just the one popliteal uh, DVT found at 90-day follow-up. Um, however, Overall, neither study is uh, fully validated. They're both uh, one-off studies um, and not supported by uh, sort of any associations, uh, though certainly those results um, seem quite promising in terms of being able to use a D-dimer uh, as a rule-out criteria in the future. Uh, so going on to DVT. Uh, so Talking about DVT ultrasounds, um, so I actually uh, discussed this with our ultrasound techs at LHSC and how they do them here. Uh, so the general scan, I know uh, some people out there do the POCUS scan, uh, but the way it's done on a formal ultrasound is starting at the common femoral vein uh, above the greater saphenous bifurcation and going all the way down to the trifurcation at the popliteal. Uh, so the ultrasound tech will compress every two centimeters, and they generally take about seven to eight images. So if you remember from my epidemiology slide, 17% of uh, DVTs in uh, pregnancy are isolated to the iliac vein. Uh, so does anyone know how we actually image, um, like where the iliac imaging uh, of veins is included in our DVT studies? Anyone? I don't think they are. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, we don't image iliac veins. It's not part of our uh, ultrasound um, compressive studies for DVT. So in terms of uh, isolated femoral or isolated uh, iliac vein thrombosis, these do present clinically somewhat different than um, a classic uh, DVT that's um, do we sort of all go for the uh, you know, lower leg calf pain symptoms? Um, these generally present with more back pain, uh, more entire leg flank or buttock swelling. Uh, they have less lower leg symptoms. So those calf measurements, calf pain, Holman's test, all those things um, really 
aren't, um, they're not meant to apply to a, an isolated iliac or pelvic vein DVT. And um, if you are very clinically suspicious of a DVT in a patient and have a negative compressive ultrasound, uh, that should be a time, uh, especially in pregnancy, to have a higher suspicion of an isolated pelvic vein uh, DVT. So on compressive ultrasound, um, like I said, they go from the common femoral right down to the popliteal. Um, because of where the iliac veins lie in the pelvis, uh, they're not able to compress them, so you can't do a compressive study of them. And actually, generally, it's not included in their algorithm to even go up into the iliac veins. If you have a excellent ultrasound tech, they may look there. If they see a clot in the femoral vein, they typically continue to move proximally until they can't see uh, the clot anymore, so they will uh, at least Doppler image the iliac veins, but that's not part of their algorithm, and that is sort of an extra that that tech is doing, looking for an extended clot, um, and it's not necessary when you order a compressive ultrasound uh, for DVT. Uh, so like I said, that isolated iliac DVT is 17% of, uh, of them in pregnancy. So it's not a insignificant number. Um, this is the algorithm pulled right from Thrombosis Canada guidelines. Um, and it's also uh, what the SOGC uses as well. So in a pregnant woman, if you suspect a DVT, compressive ultrasound of the entire proximal venous system uh, from that uh, end of the iliac vein, which is where your femoral starts, right down to the popliteal, teal, as well as Doppler examination of the external iliac vein uh, should be done. And again, that Doppler of iliac is not standard part of our ultrasound protocol. Um, if it's not diagnosed and you're still highly clinically suspicious, they recommend an MRI or at least re-imaging in seven days to look for a more distal extension. Um, and that's right from Thrombosis Canada. Sorry, I see there's a chat bubble. Um, yes, and so it's not, it's not done, and that's, uh, that's me talking directly to an ultrasound tech that works at LHSC. It's not part of the protocol. Uh, so unless you specify it, it very well could be left out of an exam. If there's no clot seen um, in the femoral, they don't, they don't have to go up and do imaging uh, Doppler exam of an iliac. Uh, so it's something that um, is not automatically put on there. And uh, from the ultrasound tech I talked to, she said, you know, if you have a good tech, they will hopefully do that, but it's not in the sort of standard protocol. Um, and could be something that's missed. I, I didn't go back and audit and, and look at how many times it was scanned um, because of the tech decided to do it versus not, um, but it's, it is something that could be missed unless it's specified. Um, so going on to actually looking at ultrasound, there are some things you can see on compressive ultrasound that might direct you towards an isolated pelvic uh, vein thrombosis. Um, so there'll be a lack of respiratory variation uh, because of the upstream uh, clot. They will have more distended veins, so they'll be more dilated. They will require a higher degree of compression to actually fully compress um, when they scan from femoral all the way to popliteal. And uh, sort of just like in MSK, if you're still highly suspicious but aren't sure, you can always compare it to the other side. Um, and that can let you know if there's, you know, if there's clear increase in pressure on one side, you, you might go digging a lot deeper for that iliac uh, DVT. And then again, you can always ask specifically for iliac imaging. Um, so uh, how good is ultrasound for actually looking at iliac veins? Um, so this is directly from an American Heart Association um, uh, paper, and it was a consensus statement by radiologists. Um, so directly from their paper, uh, isolated iliac vein thrombosis occurs in 1.6% of uh, DVTs. Sorry, someone wants to come join here. Um, and that's in your general healthy populations. Um, and uh, imaging of the iliac and pelvic veins is warranted in patients whose signs and symptoms uh, suggest uh, iliocaval disease. So again, that's that more back buttock 
um, swelling, whole leg swelling, um, and more back and, back and buttock pain. Um, and they have a normal compressive ultrasound. Um, so you can uh, go ahead and look at the pelvic venous uh, system with ultrasound, CT or MRI, um, the, directly from their paper, because the accuracy of duplex ultrasound for iliocaval DVT is not established, the threshold for CT or MRI uh, uh, venography should be low. Uh, so this is from uh, 2018 and directly from their consensus paper. So um, the radiologists aren't even sure how great it is. Uh, so again, if somebody is, uh, if you're highly suspicious, uh, it's something that you really have to think about and, uh, and maybe talk to your ultrasound tech. There's, there is, because of those, uh, signs you can see on compressive ultrasound, it might be worth talking to them and whether or not they saw any of those things or compare to the other side. Um, but considering it's only 1.6% in the general population, but 17% of pregnancy DVTs, uh, it uh, is a bit of an overlooked area in terms of investigation and imaging uh, in DVT algorithms. Uh, so in terms of treating uh, women with uh, any sort of VTE, uh, warfarin is teratogenic, never to be used in pregnancy. Um, all pregnant women were excluded from NOAC trials, uh, though they have done studies where they've seen river roxavan passes into breast milk. And uh, so none of the NOACs are recommended in pregnancy or in breastfeeding. Uh, heparin and low molecular weight uh, heparin are safe in pregnancy and warfarin is safe in breastfeeding just not in pregnancy so if someone were to need a long-term anticoagulation after pregnancy warfarin would still be an option and would be safer than a NOAC in breastfeeding and then of course for thrombolysis just like you would for uh, anyone with a life or limb threatening uh, VTE uh, these uh, Pregnant people are eligible for thrombolysis um, if they meet the same criteria as somebody who wasn't pregnant. Um, so my major take home points um, from all of this um, are that uh, the D-dimer criteria, though tempting to use because it makes sense that if it's falsely elevated in pregnancy, a negative D-dimer seems like it should be reasonable to use to rule out. Um, it's actually not supported by the American Thoracic Society Thrombosis Canada or SOGC. And uh, they don't advise using it to rule out uh, a, a DVT in, or PE in a pregnant patient. Um, so of the studies that I talked about, which are the most promising that hopefully will become validated, uh, neither the adapted years criteria or the Geneva ultrasound CTPA are validated. Um, though hopefully in the future they will be uh, to try and save some investigations. Um, and interestingly enough, though it was part of the Geneva criteria, it was still missed in some. Um, so I thought it was interesting that none, uh, none went on to actually... Um, okay. Um, none went on to uh, actually include mandatory ultrasound first for VTE, uh, which seems uh, sort of like the lowest risk imaging. Uh, so I thought it was interesting they didn't include it as mandatory imaging. Uh, for the VQ scan, uh, if the chest x-ray is normal, it's preferred to CTPA. I know in London, it's not mandatory to do a chest x-ray. Um, the Nuclear Medicine Society does still recommend it looking for uh, sort of low-hanging fruit other diagnoses, as well as making sure they're going to be uh, have normal lungs for a VQ scan, uh, though they most, uh, most pregnant women who are otherwise healthy uh, will probably have normal lungs for a VQ scan, which is why our center, I believe, doesn't require it. Um, and then that's because of the significantly lower radiations, especially if you're able to stop at the um, uh, first step of the VQ scan. And then uh, none of the algorithms I talked about, uh, so the pregnancy adapted years or the Geneva um, adjusted study, neither one includes uh, looking at isolated iliac veins as part of their um, study either. So while they don't do compressive ultrasound on everybody, they also didn't talk anything about the iliac vein thrombosis, uh, which again is 17% of VTE cases in pregnancy. So um, certainly not 
uh, insignificance. And sort of the, the biggest take home point I found from all of this um, is that if you are really suspicious of somebody having a VTE based on their symptoms and they have a normal compressive scan, um, it's worth taking a thought of whether or not you need to look harder for an iliac, uh, an iliac thrombosis in this patient. Um, so those are my references uh, and special thank you uh, to Dr. Park as well as the, um, I talked to a few radiology residents and uh, the ultrasound tech who uh, helped me sort of go over uh, what's done and what the numbers are at uh, LHSC. Are there any questions? Great talk, yeah. Michaela. Sorry, I just had a question about, um, I know that the immediate postpartum period is also a hypercoagulable time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering if any of the studies included patients who are postpartum or just pregnant patients? They didn't. They only included uh, pregnant patients. Um, and that's another good point and potentially an overlooked group of people considering their risk of uh, VTE is actually higher than in pregnancy. Uh, great job, uh, Michaela, uh, managing a talk and having a, a toddler with you at the same time. That's pretty impressive. Really independent. Yeah, well, that's very impressive. Um, for your patients that are coming in with uh, more chest-like symptoms, but with absence of DVT findings, do you think that um, that's become your practice and or you'd recommend that as your practice to start with compression sonography as kind of the low-hanging fruit? Because the value of it is uh, the lack of radiation and if you find something or do you think that it's still worthwhile to to consider the chest radiography first? Yeah, um, I, I would do the ultrasound first and uh, in sort of um, some of the uh, stuff that was put out about these two papers, um, that is some of the points that other uh, people looking at these papers have made. Um, it's likely to be quite low yield. I can't remember the numbers right off the top of my head, but as you can see, there wasn't a lot of uh, alt positive ultrasounds found if in asymptomatic people. Um, but I think it's something to think about. And again, the one thing that wasn't uh, included even when they did compressive ultrasound is there's no mention of specifically looking at iliac veins or comparing to the other side. So I think if you can do an ultrasound, you know, it's a cheap, pretty readily available test and avoid radiating this patient. I mean, it's what I would want. Um, so that's what I would do for, for my patients. Great, thanks. Uh, great job, Michaela. It's Laura Price. I just wanted to make a comment along those lines, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, just uh, my my understanding, just with your last statement there about um, if you find a positive DVT, that it'll uh, negate the need for radiation for a pregnant patient. Mm -hmm. My understanding from talking to hematology at our center is that's not actually the case. Um, they're always going to want a baseline imaging of the chest, um, unless it's just an isolated DVT you're working up. But if you're worried about PE, they're going to want a VQ scan because that way, if the patient has worsening of symptoms, you need to be able to determine if they've failed whatever regimen that they're, they're on because I've always wondered why we didn't just start with the ultrasound first. And if it's positive, stop there, do no um, imaging whatsoever. But I think anybody who has a positive is still going to go on to have um, imaging of their chest, either by CT or VQ. I don't think it means you can't start with it with an ultrasound of their leg, but it, it's not going to get you out of the imaging. Okay. Um, I didn't know that hematology does that. Certainly, I don't see these patients in follow up. Um, like if they if they are positive and put on uh, anticoagulation, hematology sees them. So if that's the case, then um, that's good to know. I guess where it would come in handy is if you're in a center that only has CT. Um, I know London and our VQs are fairly readily available, um, but lots of other centers, that's not the case. So it at least may save you from CT in that patient and allowing hematology to do the VQ as, a, as an outpatient once they're already treated. Absolutely. Laura, can I ask you, um, Laura, can I ask you a question about that? I mean, I, I think that that's a shared care decision making process that um, while hematology, you know, wants that, I would imagine that if you're having that discussion with your patients, the majority of them would, in the, in the presence of a known DBT, uh, not particularly be excited about then radio, um, doing a radiograph of their chest, whether it's a VQ or CT. Um, does hematology have an issue with that? 
So again, when I've talked to Dr. Kovacs about this, um, my understanding is, again, totally different if it's just isolated DVT you're working right, with. Right, understood. Not, yeah. Of course, you're not going to be imaging the chest in any way. But if you have a concern about PE, they're always going to request that you go on to actually image the chest for the reasons that I've outlined, because they need to mm -hmm. know if the patient were to get worse in any way, um, or have say their symptoms go away and then they come back. Does it look different? They always like to compare and that's why they kind of get upset with us too when we do like a VQ on the first imaging study and then we do a CT on the second imaging study. They like to be able to have sort of a baseline to compare between them. Of course you can never, uh, I'm sure you could have a situation where the patient just refused to do that but it's definitely not their preference and, and um, they are obviously the you know the people who are following these individuals, not mm -hmm. us. So that's my been my take home in this in the past because I could never understand why we were kind of doing things the way we did, were doing them. And that's the response I was given. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks, Laura. That, that's interesting. Um, I, I would be curious what the evidence is on how often a baseline imaging actually actually changes things or changes outcome. Because if, um, if I mean, if they were more unstable clinically, um, I think you can make a lot of decisions off that. So I know if it were myself, I probably would turn down the, the CT if I had a DVT, but uh, that's interesting. I, I didn't talk to hematology about uh, sort of the end stage management of this. Yeah, yeah it's, it's something to keep in mind. Well, Laura, that's very interesting. So when you guys are getting consent for the CT chest, do you pull the 2.2% risk of future malignancies in the breast or lung? I'm not sure if I'm 2% increase in risk, yeah. yeah. Increase risk. Do you guys quote that to the patient? I've never quoted direct radiation risks. Um, and again, if you go back and probably find 10 studies, um, most of them won't say the same thing. And that, that is part of the problem is our, our radiation risk uh, percentages are, uh, again, not... Um, it's not always well understood. It's a lot of extrapolated data and the amount of radiation they get is obviously very different um, depending on how many milligrays they actually get. I tend to make vague statements like we, we I'll say something like we, we think that a single CT probably doesn't carry too much risk, but we do know it adds up over time. So at least I'm giving them some idea without giving them data. Um, just question for Laura, do you think there might be a, um, a referral bias in patients who are referred to hematologists versus patients who are not? So like, um, you know, urologists say every kidney stone needs a CT, but they also don't see all the tiny CT or tiny kidney stones that we send home without a CT if they've had them before. Um, I wonder if patients in, for example, a community hospital without a hematology, um, I know our internists are probably a little more likely to treat based on a DVT alone and presumptive PE and would only image the chest if they deteriorate. And obviously in a hematology population, those that deteriorate and do worse are going to be more prevalent. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I Again, I don't work in a community center, so I have a hard time making any kind of comments along those lines. Um, I, I'm sure it's possible. And again, um, I'm, I'm mostly basing these comments based on my conversations with Dr. Kovacs, who certainly is one of our head you know, people in terms of thromboembolism in London. Um, but it doesn't mean that, that that's what even what the other thrombosis docs are doing. I've only spoken to him, but certainly that's the, the feedback he's given me. And with regards to the whole kidney stone comment, I would say actually in London, and I could, others online can correct me if I'm wrong, that many of us actually have the, the, the tendency to, at some point along the way, uh, have patients follow up with urology because urology has told us, even if they're small kidney stones, that they see a dietitian and get all that kind of screening done to potentially avoid future kidney stones. So even small ones, I tend to send along, but that's a side issue. Cool. Thanks. Any other questions from anyone? No? Well, thanks everyone for uh, zooming in and uh have a good rest of your day thank you, thank you. great job thank you great job good job, Michaela. Good job. thanks